Namaste. And welcome back to Anatomy in Yoga. This is day number six. It's the Monday of our second week. And as such, today's focus will be on the hips. As we concluded our work just last on our Friday, uh, we did so wrapping up the core of the body anteriorly through transversus abdominis, as well as the awareness of the obliques, both internus and externus, and then rectus abdominis, the primary trunk flexor. But then we also took it to the more personal aspects of the lower perineum and studied the levator ani, as well as the pubococcygeal muscles of uh, the muscles that we engage in Mulabandha, recognizing that anatomists refer to the three muscles that are principally of the core that includes transversus abdominis, as well as the pubococcygeal muscles that I'm just reminding us that we described on Friday. And then from a couple of days prior to that still, we also talked about the important paraspinal muscles that are intrinsic to the spine as the third component of the core of the body. And as such, now as we start to shift from the core, we're going to come into the hips next. So it just seems to me that having focused in the lower perineum and the lower core of the body, we then want to start walking that core around with some hip focus. And in doing so, we'll start to uh, back up into the plates. And we'll see that the, the next plate that I have up is plate number 469. This is the plate of the nerves of the hip and buttock. And in uh, having a moment to look at the posterior hip, we are seeing quite a collection of tiny and deep uh, muscles that are the core of the hip. And so uh, when I refer to the core of any particular joint, I'm referring to those muscles that are uh, deepest and and the connection to the joints uh, the, and the, the bones that are connected in the joint. So in this case, uh, in the hip and buttock, we have the deep lateral rotators. And on this image, you'll have uh, the five of the six deep lateral rotators described uh, in, the, in this image pretty clearly. The sixth one, we're not quite able to see here as clearly. So. I'll be bringing that through in another image, and I have referred to that before uh, when we were talking about the, uh, again, the superior image of the pelvic core. So in this image, what we're looking at is the back of the right hip, and with the sacrum central, the uh, connection between the trochanter of the femur and the sacrum or the trochanter itself, as well as other aspects of the pelvis, is what we are seeing when we look at the deep lateral rotators. Taken together as a group, they're referred to as the gogokupis. And so uh, the gogokupis have some fun names associated with all of those particular initials. So the gogo QPs are, um, here's the go, here's the go, here's the Q, and here's the PS. And so the G is stand for gemellus. So we have, in the six deep lateral rotators, we have two of the Gs, which are the gemellus. Together, those are called the gemellae. So gemellus superior is the one that's more uh, on the top, clearly, toward the head, as compared to the others. Then we have the, the obturator internus. And as we were looking at the pelvis, we were seeing the obturator foramen, which is the spot that's an opening in the pelvis. It is posterior in the pelvis, as well as the most inferior aspect other than the issue of tuberosity. So the, the obturator foramen in the pelvis is the location for the attachment of obturator internus, and we can see that also on your plate, so I'll come back to that and detail that with you further. Then we have the gemellus inferior, which is going to be a little bit lower than what we're describing so far, and then the obturator externus, which will be also surrounding the obturator membrane, now from the outside or in this at this angle, looking at it from more of the inferior. 
inferior component. So the attachment between the femoral head and this aspect, so that we have lateral rotators here as well as here, all in the back of what is that right hip. So go, go, QP. So gemellus superior, obturator internus, gemellus inferior, obturator externus. Then we have the quadratus femoris, which is smaller, shorter, and generally shaped like a very small quadrangle between the femoral head and the lateral aspect of the pelvis at the ischium. And then the piriformis. A piriformis, the, where it actually sits in the body, is the most superior of all of what I'm describing, but just the, uh, the convention of the way to refer to the deep lateral rotators together is to refer to them as the gogo cupies, and in that way we name the P part at the end. So uh, piriformis is a special muscle of deep lateral rotation in that it's the one that often of late, like in the last 10 years, has gotten the most attention uh, from uh, people having problems and pains in the general area. And so there's actually a syndrome that's named for it, the piriformis syndrome. Now, not everybody that has pain in their outer buttock has the piriformis syndrome, but just giving you a sense that uh, many of your students may have heard of the piriformis muscle where they might not have heard of the other go-go cues. And I'm, as such, you should know that there's more than just that one there. There are six muscles in the general area. And uh, there's a possibility that there's one or another of the other six muscles that's also an issue, not just the piriformis. So as we go back to look at the plate again, we can see on the right side, one, two, three, four, five labels down on the right is where the arrow or label marker for the piriformis muscle is. And so you can see that that is the most superior of the six that we're describing. Two labels underneath that, you'll see Gamella superior. And so it's just fingered in right underneath piriformis. And just below that, or inferior to that, is the space where you'll see the label to Gemellus interior, Gemellus internus. And six more labels down from there, you'll see Gim the quadratus femoris with its label. And you can see that this is relatively a shorter and uh, narrower quadrangle muscularly. So you want to look at that at, at this image. This is on the plate 469. And then uh, right above that, Gamellus inferior is your fifth of the gogo cupies. And still unable to see from here the uh, obturator externus. And again, we'll see that when we come back and take a look at the pelvic core again. So in this way, if you turn from there, the plate number 461B is the next one up that puts those six deep lateral rotators onto a leg. So um, as we're here, I just want to help Matthew with your order of your uh, pages. If you kept things all in order, it should be much beyond all of that. So uh, where we left off on Friday is just where we start up on Monday. So we had already gone all through the back. That was Wednesday. We did this whole transitional core. That was Thursday. We came in for the anterior core on Friday, and after all of that is done, and we did the, the very base of the pelvis, so that ought to help you to just keep on passing through that, and you'll find your way to uh, that right plate. And keep turning, and keep turning. You can just turn it off, I mean, this, this is not interesting for anybody, and not even for us. Uh, it's not shaped, this plate, 461B is what I have. Plate 461B. And as it's coming back in at 461B, what we're doing here is now taking the image from plate 469 and the same image of the lateral buttock, the deep lateral buttock with the superficial muscles removed, we're now seeing at the top of conveniently a leg. So we start to have a sense of where this is in space. So as you look to the labels, uh, the top label is the piriformis muscle. And so piriformis, as the label shows you again, right where we are compared to where we have been. There's the piriformis. 
here, and the bigger picture has it right there. Underneath, from piriformis, you'll see two, three labels down, obturator internus, and then the next label under gemellus inferior. Then you'll see the glute, which has been cut and referred back. Across from that, you'll see the quadratus femoris muscle. And again, shorter and a little bit more uh, specifically quad quadrangle shaped. You can see that there are lots of muscles in this area that are all doing the same thing. So with this awareness, I'm going to put that down and take it into our own bodies so we can start to have a sense of the action of lateral rotation. So that you can take your legs forward and just shake them out a little bit so that you feel comfortable here. And then uh, having not been seated too long, it should be pretty easy for us to have a sense of opening one leg to one side. So this action, as we studied in kinesiology, is called rotation. And that it's not the ankle just moving, which is what this is what that would look like. And it's not just the rotation from the knee, but this is rotation from the hip itself. So as you come into this, you can take your hands onto the back and lateral side of the hip. So that from here, as you rotate the foot open, you can feel underneath the hand the engagement of the deep lateral rotators. If you don't feel it upon the movement, it's because you're not in the right place. So you reposition your hand, and then as you move, you can feel that engagement, and then the release. Deep lateral rotators. The deep lateral rotators are functioning in every step that we take. In your book, on, uh, in the old book, it was on page 208, the new book is page 228. We have the muscles of the hip starting with the deep lateral rotators. Now in this initial image, you'll see the piriformis, obturator internus, and obturator externus. And this, from this angle, of the pelvis. So we're actually looking at it this way. That's an unusual way to look at a pelvis, you might agree. And so I just wanted to bring that through so that that might make things a little bit uh, clearer for you. Then on the other side of the image, <coughs> we have the gemelli superior <coughs> and gemelli inferior, just below it conveniently. And then again, quadratus femoris, which is the most inferior of all six of them. And as the astute student can point out, it looks like there's just three muscles on one side and just three on the other. And so they've been separated out so you can see the different distinct definition of where each attachment is. But truly, the six muscles are residing on either side. If they were all on here, it would be back to what it looked like here. The foot's on the knee, the knee's underneath the other foot, and then we want the hips both evenly seated and the hips and knees evenly horizontal. So um, in this way, that's not anywhere close to it. You need to be on a block, and when you have your foot to the inner knee, that's a different kind of position. Instead, take the foot to the knee proper so that the underneath foot should come way out underneath the knee, and this is a foot on a knee, not to the crack of the calf. Okay. And the underneath foot is, needs to come out by about 8 inches, 10 inches. That was not even 1 inch. So Both, both hips, sorry to interrupt, in my case are both on the ground, uh, but this is not down. Right. Would that so you, be part of your cushion? It sure would. Okay. You got the equation. Cool. That's the way. And for those at home. Yeah. And, for, and you might want to be on a cushion and so you're still here and trying to fudge it. Okay. And I'm just going to say this won't put it. Okay. And so don't try it at home this way either. When you round your spine and then you crank, what's vulnerable is, first of all, everything, but certainly the knee as well as the spine. And there's no breath, so it's not yoga anyway, so never mind. So either at the bar. And so we're going to shift all the way back over to working with a bar that's about the same height as one's hip with the knee up and hinging at the hips. Now we start to take it into the outer rotators this way. So come on up and observe as two students are also practicing. Sometimes we use a block to come to stand on. That's in order to keep the hips evenly squared. 
And then as you can see, opening the knee to the side with the hips even, now we might start to feel some of the sensation. How are we doing? Is this better? Good, right? <coughs> And you would feel it pretty good out there mm -hmm. too, but now better stuff. Yeah, it's the other just, side. Yeah, just this, um, not much else. Good. So, in the athletic body that has tremendous muscular building, to isolate this area of the deep lateral rotators might require a bar that's roughly a hip height. And in that way, still there's the lateral rotation that the muscle is responsible for and then stretching it once it has been into that position. I'm going to have you just lift up a little bit more neutrally through the spine and that's the work. Now clearly we're just letting you see the work on the one side of the body and in your own practice time you would switch it to the other side and consider working with the one side that's tighter for an even longer period of time. I hope this makes this aspect of the education pretty clear for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We're just having a little laugh after coming away from the bar, so to speak. So in this way, we've been uh, detailing the, C, the six deep lateral rotators. Yes, we have. Now what I want to do is just back up a tiny bit and speak to the way that the hips are variable, meaning that the hip, the hip joint itself has a number of variations that are described in your book on page 183. And all of the variations of the way femoral head refers to the femoral neck. All uh, have the, the relationship of the shaft to the neck angle of the femur. All uh, speak volumes as to the way that the natural alignment will be within the body. And the way that that shows up is that the normal or average angle, again, of the, the neck of the femur as it relates to the shaft is about 135 degrees. That's roughly what we're looking at here on Lucy, although he's trying to be a little pigeon-toed right now. And uh, some folks have a, a, a tighter angle, just 120 degrees here. So instead of this wider opening position, there's less, and so in this way, it's harder for the body to abduct the legs to the side. And that's a variation that's called katsavara. Others could have perhaps a wider angle, so that instead of 135 degrees here, we could have closer to 150 degrees here. A 150 degree angle would mean that it was easier to abduct, which Lucy's not gonna be good at, but if I rotate his hip, then we can get wider abduction, which is to say, for many of us, if we try to take just a straight abduction, we'll only get so far when the femoral head is in its neutral position. But if instead we take the lateral rotation first and then we abduct, then we might be able to get beyond which is the spot we've been to earlier. But here you're seeing it in a way that might start to make sense to you. In that, in that way, we're able to clear aspects of the bones so that we don't have compression of bone to bone, and instead we can access the innate range of motion that's possible. And so in this way, when you're wondering, why can't I go farther, you might look to the possibility that you might have a little bit of a katsovara, your angle of your femoral head to the shaft, might be set at something less than 135 degrees. Now, I think it's important for you to know that God's going to love you anyway. It doesn't matter what the angle of the hip is in terms of whether you are a being of light and love. It might matter in terms of how far you go in a particular posture which we like to say, so what? It doesn't matter how far you go. It does matter how you get there. So again, as long as the spinal length is maintained and the breath is free and deep, everything else is extra credit. So it's okay if you didn't go so far. And if you'd like to go a little bit farther, you might just try your lateral rotation first and then the abduction that might allow you to clear and move farther. So I hope that that just helps to make a little bit more sense of things for you. In addition, we have 
the hip joint variation. of the, the angle of the antiversion. And this is a reference to the angle at which the femoral head sits into the acetabulum. So the acetabulum is the word for the, the socket. The, so the ball is fitting into the socket. So the ball of the femoral head sitting into the socket who has its own name and the socket's name is acetabulum. So the angle that the femoral head sits into the acetabulum is also variable, meaning we are not cookie cutters. We are not identical. My hips and your hips might not even look like they're from the same animal, you know, in, in a way that could help us understand why some postures might work better for some of us than others. And so I think that this is helpful for some of us to come to understand so we know why we might experience limitations when others look like they perhaps don't have those limitations. There could be a very good reason why you can't go farther than you're going, and it could have something to do with this, the antiversion angle. So when the, so the acetabulum, the Latin root of acetabulum, is that which indicates vinegar cup. So if I had a tiny, what we would call a shot glass, a little glass, into which you put just a small amount of liquid. Back in the day, those would be called vinegar cups because you wouldn't want to drink a whole lot of vinegar, which is just a little bit. So the vinegar cup could be of a particular size. It could be this tall, and you could have this wide of an opening, or it could be shorter and have an even bigger, rounder opening. Both would be called still vinegar cups. Well, this metaphor continues to the hip socket, meaning some of us have a very shallow acetabulum with a wider opening, that'd be me. That's why the leg does the whoop de doo in a 360 degree rotation. Shallow vinegar cup with a broad opening. Yeah. And so that's um, unusual. The head's very much more exposed. It has it loses contact posteriorly and in lateral rotation that happens in a particular kind of alignment, and that's structural. Now others have instead, instead the antiversion angle means that the head is gonna fit into that socket and maintain complete contact from the head into the socket, and that'll mean that there will be less range of motion. There could be a whole lot less range of motion. I've personally worked with people who only had the possibility of opening their legs, say, this wide. And what would stop them wasn't muscular tension here. It was that they felt compression on their bones here. That would be, again, the acetabulum right onto the femoral head, bunk, bone to bone. Can't go again and again, wider and wider. And we know that God's loving that person just like they might be loving this person. So just bringing it through in a way that, again, can start to make sense to you. And um, again, helping it to come to life from your book and book depression in that way. This has a, a shorter neck to a longer shaft, also informs how much abduction and abduction we'll be able to have anyway. So all of these complete components are variable to a person as it comes to the hip itself. So I'm hoping that this starts to uh, make a little bit more sense to you. So a taller and less wide hip socket would be perhaps less flexible um, or be able to make less rotation. Yeah, less and range of motion. Sense. And it would make for less range of motion. Okay. So all possible mm -hmm. kinds of movements would be decreased. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It does, doesn't it? You can, you can get that in, in your brain and that makes sense a lot to, in, in that general way. We could also say that that would be a hip that would be uh, well less likely to have problems with dislocation. So there's something good about a structurally sound hip. Uh, in that way we can say that um, women tend to have this sh shorter and broader hip socket to femoral head relationship. In that way women tend to be more flexible to the range of motion that the structure allows. 
and I, in this way, the way the angle in the body that results in the greatest contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum is really this. It's an all fours position in which, with the hips flexed, as much of that femoral head as possible is on the inside of the acetabulum when we're here. So that's the position in which people generally are not going to feel compression around the hip socket. And so with that, we all can say that we feel relatively the same when we're just on our all fours as per the hip issue. It's when we start moving towards our extremes, we can really look like we're, you know, different animals. And there's a good reason for it. <coughs> Related to the bone, does it mean that nothing can change to get people more flexible? That's kind of the idea. So I'm just appreciating that. Yeah, generally speaking, you'll go back to what we said early on about bones. Bones are one-third elastic. Yeah. So there's a possibility for some change occurring, but not much. Yeah. Only one-third elastic, not, not two-thirds. So two-thirds pretty well set. So mostly that will not be changing much. Not likely that I'm going to grow more acetabulum. Not likely that my vinegar cup will ever get deeper. Not going to be growing, particularly my genetic material says grow a hip socket this way. Unless we change my genetic material, I'll still be sustaining my hip socket that's been built this way. If you work on it when someone is growing up, Have more towards, towards more, yeah. If you work on a person when they're growing up and the body is more and bones are more elastic as we're growing, mm -hmm. quite possibly could develop more range of motion. But for a person like me, you can't, I wouldn't be able to develop less range of motion. Yeah. <clears throat> that I'm generally put together that way anyway means I probably would still be having to deal with. Uh, what results in hypermobile hips. I probably still need to strengthen and condition around my hips so that I take responsibility for those sockets. But it's a very good point, very good question in terms of if we start early, um, my, my belief is of course if we start early and we you know, started practicing yoga as a kid, I was nine years of age, it might have to do with why the hypermobility is completely still throughout my body. Um, I think that the, you know, the earlier we start with anything that we're really after, the more likely it will have a lifelong positive consequence. And yet, also with it, there would be responsibility in that, again, the more flexible a body is, what that means is that there's a greater need to be responsible about strengthening and protecting those same joints that might be otherwise hypermobile. So I'm hoping that this makes sense. I know that in general, in yoga, through our appreciation for the beauty of the form and the possibility of infinite potential, we can want to really go to the far extremes of postures, and yet you just have got to get again and again on the soapbox that um, that's not what it's about. You know, yoga is just about cleaning the temple, keeping the body healthy, keeping the body strong and open, yeah, but not necessary for us to do any of the farthest reaches of, of practice. You're fabulous as you are, and you always have been since you first walked in, so not to worry about that. In this way, from uh, looking at the nerves of the hip and buttock, we can, again, come back to where we were at plate 461B, and from this conversation, we'll start to put on the other musculature of the posterior hip. In doing so, we uh, can start to add the awareness of the hamstrings onto the posterior uh, leg, and as we come to consider the hamstrings, we're talking about the semi-membranosus and semi-tendinosus, as well as the biceps femoris. So these three muscles comprise the hamstrings, and again, they are notorious for tightness. And uh, in this way, sometimes tightness in the hamstrings is such that it's hard to access that awareness of the deep lateral buttock tension. And so for that purpose, uh, we can just focus on hamstrings when we just do hamstrings and just outer buttock at that different angle up on the bar in this room, just here to now. So when you look at your image on plate 461B, you can see that the hamstrings are polyarticulate muscles crossing both the hip joint as well as the knee joint. And as such, the hamstrings are hip extenders. 
and also knee flexors. So to stand and to just bring that through in motion, again, the hamstrings residing on the posterior leg are hip extenders and also knee flexors. So if I wanted to both flex the knee and extend the hip, then the hamstrings engage and you might be able to see them engaging there. That means if I want to stretch the hamstrings, which is what we're usually after, we want to, of course, flex the hip and with the hip flexed, we want the knee to extend. So in this way is a classic hamstring stretch. So give yourself a moment and folding forward with the legs forward, see to it that the spinal length is maintained. And so breathing as you're reaching through, again with the knee straight, but the hip flexed and folding forward, the stretch could easily be in the back of the thigh, as in, in the hamstrings. But you're feeling that one okay, yeah? Make it sense? Really good. That's it. Really good. From here, we'll get a little bit more superficial when it comes to the posterior view. This is a more superficial uh, dissection of the posterior leg. And so now what we see instead is with the gluteus maximus covering, and so that's uh, next plate 465, you should, 465A, that should be right behind. So we have glute max covering all the detail. Underneath it we have glute medius as well as glute minimus, also obscuring the six deep lateral rotators. So again, just like when we looked at the superficial back, all we saw was strap and lap, the little deltoid. Here instead, when we're looking at the posterior leg and its most superficial image, all you see are hamstrings and buttock. I mean the gastric, the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, gluteus maximus. And you can't get the rest of the detail. So from here, we will turn again. And now we start to come around to the front of the hip and the front of the leg. This is at plate 463. And, and maybe it's too frustrating to find is in there and that's fine. Um, you have these images right there too when you want to find them. Anterior view, this is the deepest dissection. This is the front of the leg. When we've referred and removed the other musculature so we can see what we have at the deepest depth in the anterior leg, what we find are uh, primarily the adductors. We have a group of adductors from this standpoint, we have the initial one, the label at which the second image from the top is at the adductor longus muscle, and as such, we'll know it's going to be the longest of the adductors. We have, in addition to it, two more labels below it, adductor brevis, and we think that one would be a, bit, a little bit shorter, and it is. We know that adduction is the effort of drawing the leg back toward midline, or even crossing beyond midline, that's all adduction. And when you see the fibers and where they're residing with the muscles, you can just imagine that contracting those muscles would result in the legs coming closer together. So adductor longus brevis, as well as label farther down, is the adductor magus, which has, in addition to the long uh, images of the fibers, has some uh, longitudinal fibers, so it actually looks like two muscles that are combining together. Adductor magnus is the bulkiest aspect of the inner thigh muscles. In addition, we have gracilis and its long fibrous component attaching towards the medial knee, and pectineus, which let's see, where do we have pectineus's image in there? That must have made it to another one of your plates. So we have uh, these images of the muscles of the adductors. And uh, we, from here, turning on to the next image, gets it more superficial. This into plate 320. Again, I know you can hardly wait to look at your pictures when you find them and get them in order. And uh, as we start to put on the quadricep muscles, we start some of the definition of the adductors. But here we can see pectineus, which was obscured in the last image. So pectineus, again, 
quite medial and close to gracilis, but running from that medial border towards a more lateral attachment onto the femur. Pectinia is much shorter in the groin, whereas gracilis, also a groin muscle, but it attaches polyarticulate crosses the hip as well as the knee. As we are looking at the uh, quads, here we can see vastus lateralis, vastus medius, as well as rectus femoris. And what we can't quite here is we can't quite see vastus intermedius here because it's deep to these muscles. So when it comes to the quads, which we have four of, we have the rectus femoris as well as vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and underneath all three of those is vastus intermedius. And uh, in addition, in this image, we're seeing three of the four quads, again, the fourth one being underneath it, so we're not seeing it specifically, and then we're seeing the collection of adductors, in which there are principally five adductors, and they're all laying right in here, still obscured in part by the quad. What I wanted to highlight about this further is inferior attachment. And uh, with it, then we start to get a sense of how it is that the legs intimately connected to the trunk, and the psoas again, um, helping to create rather a bridge between the top of the body and the bottom of the body, between the trunk and the legs. And so seeing uh, right as the iliopsoas is attaching in, right in the midst of these hip flexors of the quads, as well as these hip adductors of the adductors themselves, might start to give us a greater sense of the uh, intimate connection between those muscle groups. From uh, plate 320, we'll take it into plate 458A, and now we're seeing uh, more of the anterior view, the superficial dissection. So this is relatively more like the leg intact. And we've just removed the fat and the skin so that we can see the quads, rectus femoris, vastus, medialis on the medial side, lateralis on the lateral side, intermedius, which we can't see, and an intermediate depth between the superficial and the greatest, deepest muscles. In addition, we're seeing here sartorius, which is the longest muscle in the body, polyarticulate, crossing both the hip and the knee. We're only seeing it now as it is the most superficial of the anterior thigh muscles, and in all the other images we needed to cut and refer the sartorius so that we can see the other structures that were being defined. In addition, laterally, we're seeing one, two, three, four labels down on the left side in your drawing, like when you're looking at it, that's the left side. We'll see the label for tensor fascia lata muscle. I still try to order that when I go in for a coffee beverage from time to time. I like your tensor fascia latte. <laughs> and you know, that makes people think maybe you're an anatomist or just a weirdo. It might help you just remember a little bit more what is T TFL and what does it stand for? And TFL, the tensor fascia lata. And uh, in that way, we know with a word like tensor, it's probably going to be pretty tense. And with a word like fascia, it's probably full of fascia. And it is. And with a word like lata, it's probably lateral. And it is. So we have this tense fascia that's lateral in the leg that doesn't taste good if you have it in a cup of joe. Um, but on the side of your thigh, it helps to connect the outer buttock, the lateral ro rotators and the lateral buttock, down to the lateral knee. I find that very helpful to keep those parts together. And uh, in doing so, what often is the case is we can have tremendous tension here tremendous tightness here that can make it really hard to even cross the legs. So sometimes when it's hard to just cross the leg over or to wrap it around in Garudasan, it has to do with this extreme tension in the lateral thigh. It could also have to do with the bulk or the size of the thigh as compared to the other thigh. Meaning that if you can, if the more massive the musculature, the the closer the legs are together and the harder it is to apparently cross them completely, let alone to wrap the legs around one another. So sometimes in the uh, 
in the athletic body, the greater musculature, the larger mass of the musculature can result in an inability to work the bones around one another to even get to some of these structures to stretch out. So in this way, when you start to see the picture of TFL, where we're able to see most of it is, is right in the side pocket, but what it does is it attaches, TFL attaches from the gluteus on the posterior part of the body all the way through the iliotibial band down to that lateral knee. So it connects through a band of connective tissue, and you'll see the label for that here, the iliotibial tract, and that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven labels down, again, on the left side as you look at your image. From here, as we come down into the front of the knee, you'll see the patella. So that says moid bone, the kneecap. And you can see that the patella is encased in the common tendon of the quadriceps. So rectus femoris tendon joining with a part of the quadricep femoris tendon con connecting through the patella, then landing on the tibial prominence so that that and as I'm just engaging through my tendon here, you can see that the, this quadriceps tendon encases the patella in it and secures it right at this tibial prominence. And um, otherwise, if not, if I don't have the tendon engaged, I can move the kneecap back and forth and up and down. The sesamoid bone is able to slip around in all those ways just as I'm playing with my knee here for you. And you can feel that. But the moment that I engage the quadricep, and as that tendon to work, there's no fudging on that. So now the kneecap doesn't move. And so this is one way in which some folks have a tendency for their patella to slip and to not stay in the right groove to protect the knee. And as such, the ongoing description of the need for that is to strengthen through the quads, to strengthen in that way the quad tendon so that the Patella has a place to fit. Like in those knees, does it feel okay right now today? And did you, were you able to let it be loose so it could move? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. loose, is, loose is not your first name. Right now. There you go. Yeah, mm -hmm. come on up. You can bring your knee here. You bring both. I'm not going to hurt it, I promise. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I could. I have my teeth. Uh -huh. Okay, use your hands back by your hips. So you can just sit back and you can relax here. Just relax in there. Okay, just relax in yeah. And so we're not trying to open the yeah. So that's good movement laterally. And we can get a little bit this way too. Now I'm going to have you flex through ankle. Good, really straightening the knee, lift the heel up a little bit, lift the whole leg up a little bit. And now this tendon turned on. And not move. And not move. Okay. Now you feel it? Okay. I bet the other one's good too. Big girl, you happy right there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, you got it good enough. Thank you. You're doing great just to be upright. From here, turning to 464, we'll see the muscles of the lateral hip and thigh. And doing so, initially, this is uh, the, as the lateral view, it is the most superficial dissection. So we have plenty of gluteus maximus hogging up the view here posteriorly, and plenty of quads anteriorly, and the hamstrings posteriorly. But what this image is primarily wanting to bring through is this awareness of the long, broad iliotibial band, or iliotibial tract. You can see, yes, ilium running all the way from the superior aspect of the pelvis from the ilium all the way down with tensor fascia lata attaching into that tendon. Then the entire iliotibial band uh, coming all the way through to attach at the, this is the fibular prominence. So here's your tibia and here's the fibula. And so we talked early on as the fibula is uh, rather like a safety pin, sits right into the catch of the tibial plateau. As this is the case, and that's the structure here, the iliotibial band then comes down and helps to secure right over the top of that safety 
pin catch. It helps to secure that there, to help to keep that little fibula right in place. But if there's a trauma laterally, any blunt force that comes laterally, the first order of business would be to spring out the fibula. The iliotibial band will still continue to keep you able to stand upright. So that's what's in lots of the big part helpful for you there, just to give you something else to stand up on. You can see the patella here encased within that the tendon again and the tendon is attachment. And then we start to see just a little bit more of the detail in the lower leg, which we will come into in for a few more days yet. So from here, you'll turn to see where the lateral view of the muscles of the leg come down through, just so that you can see in just this part still, so you can get a real clear sense of the iliotibial tibial band coming down through the lateral knee, attaching onto that fibula uh, right below the tibial prominence. And again, anytime we're seeing that white connective tissue that shows up on the plates in this week, we know that all of that connective tissue is there to keep us together. The white strapping tape, the clear strapping tape of the image is there to keep us, again, together in these regions, not for us to be ongoingly try to stretch these areas apart. As I turn from there and we come into more of the knee work for now, we're just going to leave off those few plates. And I'm going to back up and take a look at how we've done so far with um, our other materials out of the book. Yeah, I think we're looking pretty good. A few more details we may back up into later on as we review. Uh, but for right now, I want to just bring it through to us this way. So when it comes to the group of the hip flexors, we have uh, several, and all of them we've described and looked at in pictures and you've been reading about in your book, and now to just give it to you as a group. The hip flexors include iliacus, the psoas, that's so as major and minor. We saw early on that Ilio psoas is that combination of those three muscles, iliacus, psoas major, and minor. So all together, ilio psoas. In addition, the hip flexors include tensor fascia lata, which has been just described here, two ridiculous points, and hopefully you can remember those as it's attaching to the iliotibial band. As well as the rectus femoris, we have abbreviated here as rectfem. Sounds like a bad punk rock band, but you can say I heard about it here first. So rectus femoris, as well as gluteus minimus and gluteus medius, both are helping with hip flexion through the iliotibial band. And as such, and when you read about that in the book, you'll go, how, how does the, the buttock help to flex the hip through its translation on the iliotibial band? We also have hip flexors of gracilis which is a, a deep groin muscle that is polyarticulate from the crossing the hip as well as the knee, right, uh, attaching inferiorly to the tibial plateau, as well as sartorius, defined as the longest and most superficial hip flexor and longest and most superficial aspect of the anterior thigh, crossing the hip socket as well as the knee, kind of crossing from the outer hip to the inner knee, sartorius, and then finally the hip flexor of pectineus. Pectineus, again, more of a deeper, sh shorter groin muscle as seen earlier in your plates. So these are the hip flexors. Now let me just make sure I've got them all. Oh, yes. Well, let's also have this detail on the hip flexors. As seen on Former side, rectus femoris of the quadriceps is a hip flexor. Let's just make it clear that the vastus, so that means vastus medius, lateralis, and the intermedius, which we saw in the outer and the inner, but we didn't see the deeper. So we saw the lateralis and medialis, we didn't see intermedius. These three muscles, the three vasti, are not part polyarticulate. They do not cross the hip. 
As such, they have no function on the hip. The three of the four quads do nothing for the hip. Often we don't know that. We think the quads must be the hip flexor. So this is just to clear that up in the brain. They can't move a joint if they don't cross the joint. So three of the four quads are instead only knee extenders. As such, we'll talk about that when we come back around to knees and elbows. So just want to make that clear now before we get any farther away. And we're still talking about the hip. So I know the knees trying to creep in here, um, but we're backing the knee up and we're staying hip. And as such, we'll come to the awareness of the hip extenders, uh, gluteus maximus, adductor magnus, and the hamstrings of the semi-membranosus, semi-tendinosus, and biceps femoris. And so bringing this to you this way again, the gluteus maximus, if I just take my hand onto the posterior hip and start to extend the hip, I can feel the engagement through glute max. And also take it to the specific location and to experience in glute medius as well. Usually you feel glute medius on the opposite leg when you're standing in a one-legged balance. So as I'm gesturing and extending through this hip, I'm palpating this side's glute medius as it's engaging even more. As well as the adductor magnus and hamstrings of semimembranosus, tendinosus, and biceps femoris all three of which are polyarticulate posterior leg muscles. So all three hamstrings have function on the hip. And we're going to see later, since they're polyarticulate, they're also affecting that other joint, meaning the knee, so a knee, knee flexors. In this way, turning. Yeah, to just have that moment focusing on the hamstrings. Some folks find it a little bit interesting to get the sense of hamstrings and their name. Here we live in the land of Bali, in which the pigs here are totally sacred, and especially they're wonderful during sacred feasting times. And so when you take a pig and you want to turn it into ham, well, this isn't a pig, but just pretend with me, they would slaughter the pig and then hang it as I'm hanging Lucy from right here, from the heels. I'm, I'm hanging her from her heels. Okay, him, he's a guy with that tall pelvis. We were there. In the pig, the way that this occurs is they go right through the Achilles tendon to hold the pig up. And it's in this way, they have very short uh, lower legs. So it looks as if it's the hamstring that they're hanging, they're stringing the ham up from right here. They string the ham up from the back of their legs is the point. And so that might change how you view the next time you eat ham, or it also might just change your ability to remember that the hamstrings are in the back of the body and where they got that name. And when they're not having that name, it helps us to just be able to be aware that they are the biceps femoris, so a two-headed posterior leg muscle. Again, biceps with biceps. In the arms, with two heads, we also are spine, we have biceps in the back of the leg. And if, we, if in fact I can turn my leg around the other way, relatively like this, and then engage through the hamstrings like that, it's kind of like, right, here's my arm, and I'm flexing the elbow and engaging the hamstring of the arm, the bicep, here engaging the hamstring here, and you start to see its engagement as you see it. Biceps femoris, you might remember that now. What does bicep mean and where are they located in more than one location? As well as semi-tendinosis and semi-membranosis, which are, yeah, just a little tendon-like and also, yeah, just a little membrane-y. Meaning they're tight, they're firm, they're made of stuff that feels like they're probably not going to stretch a whole lot unless you stay after it, and that's the case. And so in that way, if we were to revisit that consideration of, gee, if a person started early in their life to stretch a lot, would that make a difference? Absolutely, when it comes to such things as just regular muscles. Whereas when we were talking about the structure of the pelvis to the femoral head and shaft, that part's not likely to change much. But stretching those hamstrings can make a huge difference 
in your ability to, of course, stretch the hamstrings later. Mostly what I can see at this point in my life is that the hamstrings, if we stretch them more and regularly and more regularly, what we save ourselves from is the low back pain that comes about from tight hamstrings drawing us into this folding, rounding, forward position. So there's lots of good to be said about stretching with the hamstrings you know, pretty much for your life. So I'll do mine. I'm hoping that you do yours too. And when it comes to the abductors, we, we uh, listed the, and looked at the position of the adductors. Now we're going to talk about the abductors instead. So these are the uh, muscles and also uh, membranes that help us to take the legs wider apart. And so TFL, tensor fascia lata, is uh, the primary abductor. Uh, in addition, the deep lateral rotators of the buttock that we were describing, the gogo cupies, are also assisting with abducting. If you take your hand to the deep lateral rotators and you start to open the leg to the side, now I don't feel much here, it's not until I'm at the end of my range of motion that the, those muscles are actually helping. This TFL is so strong, they'll just do it all until I get right about there. Then both gemellis and both obturators and the piriformis, but not the uh, quadratus femoris, the, the deepest one we didn't feel very much to. So meaning the deepest or the most inferior one, the one that we found fi finally at the deepest spot in the steer posture folding forward. We extend Shauna and I both said, yeah, now I feel that lowest one. That lowest one is not an abductor. So you don't have to worry with it here. So just to give a sense. So it's TFL and the Gogo QPs, or Dr. Q. And then uh, Sartorius is also an abductor. And we know that from its placement on the medial knee. If I take a ribbon from lateral hip to medial knee and wanted to contract here, what that would do is open the leg. To the side. Oh, the abduction. Oh, yeah, we remember that. So those are the abductors. In addition, I just wanted to detail the, the gluteus medius as an abductor. Whereas as we study further the buttock wheel, I'll come to understand that gluteus medius is also an extender of the hip, and uh, that gluteus minimus is a flexor of the hip and a medial rotator of the hip. This gluteus maximus is an extender and a lateral rotator. So when it comes to the three glutes on either side of the body, it helps to just differentiate the different purposes of the different glutes. Then as it comes to the adductors, or those muscles that help us to draw the legs back together, adductors are pectineus, gracilis, and adductor brevis longus and magnus. There are additional muscles that also function as adductors, uh, but when it comes to the primary group of the five adductors, I'm going to stay with these for right now. I taught earlier on that uh, the psoas, from its placement in the trunk very medially, it also is an adductor of the leg. Uh, so for instance, just wanted to highlight that. And so with this, we have now had a sense of the uh, muscles of the hip, muscles that allow us to laterally and medially rotate the hip, as well as to flex the hip and extend the hip, to abduct and adduct the hip. And so now we've got something we can do to walk our core around. Now from this place, we'll start to come to conclusion for today. And uh, as we come back in tomorrow, we will be doing some review in between time which we always hope you do too. If you found that you need to get your papers back in order, I wouldn't be surprised. I know that after each of my teaching sessions, and the first thing I do is reorganize myself so that I'm fresher for the next day. You might like that approach too or not. Um, just things that might be helpful to you. Otherwise, as we come in tomorrow, we'll look at the other ball and socket joint of the shoulder. And so some of the features of the ball and socket joint that we've been studying of the hip will apply to the shoulder. So I hope that these words help to get us straight for that. Namaste.